Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. Annie Laurie and I are co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. I'm, I'm Andrew Seidel, a constitutional attorney here at FFRF. Today's topic is the ever-timely, unfortunately ever-timely, evolution and creationism controversy. And we decided to tackle this topic this week in honor of the magnificent Clarence Darrow statue that FFRF has underwritten, which will be dedicated in Dayton, Tennessee at the end of the week. And that's Dayton, Tennessee, which is the home of the famous 1925 Scopes trial that pitted evolution in the schools against the creationists. And also it pit the famed attorney, Clarence Darrow, against William Jennings Bryan in the courtroom. And I'm sure you know that the trial disgracefully ended in a conviction of John Scopes for breaking the law by teaching evolution in the schools. Bryan College placed a statue to honor Bryan on the lawn of the Ray County Courthouse in Dayton in 2005. So it was a little imbalanced. And so <clears throat> we're delighted that FFRF is part of balancing that history and giving Dayton, Tennessee, a gift of artwork of lasting significance fashioned by the highly talented sculptor Zenas Frudakis. The installation of this statue is this Thursday and the dedication is this Friday. So we don't have a photo of the real thing yet, but we do have this artist's conception of what the lawn will look like with the Clarence Darrow statue. We have some preliminary photographs. You can see the evolution of this statue. Some of the work was actually done in the kitchen of Don McLean, songwriter of American Pie. By the way, and we have some, we have some photos of the statue as it is being created right here as well. Well, rather unbelievably, this beautiful statue of an eminent civil libertarian has sparked a lot of controversy, including threats by this local woman. She has said she's going to stop the installation of the monument, and she's quoted Bible passages about executing the heathens. And she's, she's holding a shotgun in that um, photo of her on Facebook. Some of the Tennessee Pastors Network held a small meeting on July 1st in Dayton, Tennessee, to protest the statue. They called it a rally, but it was really tiny, um, so it's not really a rally. But about half the room was filled with supporters of the Clarence Darrow statue. And you can see that sign, welcome Clarence Darrow. <laughs> uh, the humorous aspect of this so-called rally was the comment by a pastor who insisted that our founding fathers were not atheists or evolutionists. And you probably already know that the founders thought science was so important that they provided for it as a government function in our Constitution. Congress is supposed to, quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights of their respective writings and discoveries. As men of the Enlightenment, they would have been thrilled had they lived long enough to read Darwin's Origin of Species, which came out in 1859 and answered so many questions especially some that they had. Because, quote, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, as Theodosius Dobzhansky put it. Here at Freethought Hall in Madison, Wisconsin, we are the proud owners of a silicone sculpture of Charles Darwin, who resides in our library. And he's so lifelike that he frequently scares visitors to the building. And sometimes he scares our staff. Anyway, we're greatly looking forward to seeing history being balanced, finally, at the home of the Scopes trial later this week. So let's talk briefly about the state of the law, Andrew. So the law on this is actually pretty clear. It is unconstitutional to prohibit the teaching of evolution. The earliest Supreme Court decision on this was Epperson versus Arkansas in 1968. And the courts have been so good on this that creationists and legislatures rarely test it in, in the imperative directly anymore. Instead, they typically try to circumvent the rule by teaching creation or intelligent design, or by adding disclaimer stickers to evolutions or textbooks. But the courts have consistently ruled that creationism, no matter how it is disguised, cannot be taught in the public schools. In Edwards v. Aguilar, a 1987 case, the Supreme Court held that public schools cannot teach, quote, scientific creationism. And it struck down the Louisiana Balanced Treatment for Creation Science and Evolution Science in the Public Schools Instruction Act. 
In the most recent case to address this issue, Kitzmiller v. Dover, which was a 2005 case, the court found that intelligent design was simply creationism relabeled. And the court held that because intelligent design is not science, the conclusion is inescapable that the only real effect of a policy promoting intelligent design is the advancement of religion. In that case, by the way, the school district actually paid out over a million dollars in legal fees for defending this patently unconstitutional policy. And I like to joke, and I guess lots of people like to joke, um, that creationists are proof of evolution because their backdoor attempts to inject creation creationism into science classes keep evolving. And I also like to say that it is a black eye on our nation that so many adult Americans reject evolution. It's only recently been um, a major survey that found a majority by slim margin accept evolution. And typically, we see about half of Americans reject evolution. And that really holds our nation back. The journal Science published a 2005 study making the public acceptance of evolution in 34 Western countries. And the United States ranked 33, second to last. And understanding evolution is absolutely essential to any um, comprehension of biology, medicine, pharmaceutical research, agriculture, biotechnology. We cannot understand these things without understanding evolution. So this resistance to accepting evolution is putting our students and therefore the future of our country at a significant disadvantage and retarding progress and imperiling the standing of the United States. Um, Eugenie Scott, who's executive director of the National, who was the executive director of the National Center for Science Education, put it this way, you can't really be scientifically literate if you don't understand evolution and you can't be an educated member of society if you don't understand science. So, um, so that's no <laughs> laughing matter, but sometimes you can find humor. Yes, and we wanted, we wanted to share some cartoons by our favorite cartoonist, Don Addis, who recently died, but he was the very talented cartoonist of the St. Petersburg Times. And he did a number of cartoons uh, making fun of creationists, and so we have a little show for you. And that's the cartoonist, Don Addis, who was, had a funny way of explaining complex issues. So evolution is, to some people, a complex issue, and to others, it's very simple. To me, it's just change over time. But this is Ask an Atheist, and so, um, Andrew, do we have any questions from... We actually have quite a few questions today. Uh, the first question is from Steve Atch, who asks, I've been an atheist for over 40 years, and I'm curious as to the difference between creationism and intelligent design. Are there differences? 
Well, we know from the uh, Kitzmiller case that the intelligent design is just a dressed up creationism. It's just the same old biblical fundamentalism where they're trying to make it look scientific. When they use the phrase intelligent design, well, the word design implies a designer, so there's a creator, so that's creationism. It is. It's just rebranded, and that's what the Dover versus Kitzmiller case actually holds. And there was a really interesting fact that the, the uh, parents discovered in that case. The textbook that they were trying to use of pandas and people, actually they did a find and replace for creationists in the old version of pandas and people and replaced that term with intelligent design proponents. And there was actually a spot where they messed up and it said, see intelligent design proponentists ists huh. uh, because they had misspelled creationists. So when it got when they did the find and replace, it actually just left it there. So it was a smoking gun showing that creationism and intelligent design are exactly, exactly the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, we're very clear on that point. But maybe the slight difference is that when people hear the word creationism, they think the God of the Bible, this personal being who went, boom, when I create. But when people hear the phrase intelligent design, well, that could be like maybe any God or some nebulous concept of a deity, which is how they're trying to sneak it into the schools. I think that I think the court would have disagreed with you on that one, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, I think creationism really is no different than intelligent design. I think it's it's just they're trying to rebrand it and they're trying to sneak it in through that back door. And I think they're probably relying on on people's feelings like that without actually kind of the critical thought involved. So we have another question? We have another question. This is from Sabrina Louise, Louisades. Meredith, sorry for butchering your name. I apologize. What does it take to convince a person that creationism is not rational? Dan, you're the debater. <laughs> well, it's Bible fundamentalism. Well, because the only evidence, and I use that word in quotes, the only evidence they have for it. it isn't really evidence at all. It's a story. It's a book out. Of, it's a story out of the book of Genesis that, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that's what creationism is. It's a story, and there's a lot of creation myths around the world. My Native American tribe had a myth that was like the turtle floating on the water, and it dug down in the mud and brought up the continents and all those things. That's a creation myth. So. Basically, it's a cute story, but that's all it is. Other than that, there's no evidence at all for the idea of creation. Well, I don't think it's a cute story. <laughs> Eve was framed, my gosh, by the I end mean, the of turtle. The turtle is oh, a I cute see. story. I thought you were talking about Genesis. No, not Genesis. By the third chapter of Genesis, woman has lost her identity, and she's been blamed for bringing sin and death into the yeah. world, and she's been cursed with motherhood, so... You know, in a, that she should bring forth children in sorrow and suffering. So, but that's but good. The, you the did. <laughs> I wasn't talking about the snake story, the okay. turtle story. The turtle, but but, but so I don't know that we really answered Sabrina's question. I mean, it, what it takes is that somebody is willing to bifurcate their religious views and use reason in accepting scientific um, evidence. And if you're a real fundamentalist, you're not going to be able to do that. But Dan, uh, your story does say something about um, the evolution of your reason, because it was Adam and Eve being portrayed as a metaphor in some of the slightly more liberal churches that you were um, entertaining in as a Christian missionary and singer that got you on your journey out of, reason, out of religion. Because Adam and Eve is a story, and there were a lot of Christians, there are a lot of Christians today, theistic evolutionists, who think that the story of Adam and Eve is similar to the parables that Jesus told about the prodigal son. They weren't really true stories. It was just a, a moral message. And so the ancient Israelites invented this parable called Adam and Eve to explain sin and all of that. Well, and, and so, you found that very shocking as a fundamentalist, but then gradually you saw the people weren't loonies and they yeah. were nice, and then you... And, then, and now we know that there could not have been an Adam and an Eve. There could not have been a first man and a first woman. And even if there were, they would have come out of Africa, not out of the garden in the Middle East. So there's something weird about the story itself. But, but I think going back to Sabrina's question, um, the creationists never give any evidence for no positive scientific studies or research or any of that all they do is they attack evolution as if simply by destroying your opponent so you've somehow proved your own case they actually don't make a case 
for creationism, and that's what's irrational about it. And I think it's it's really the million dollar question. You know, how how can you actually change somebody's mind? I think. Um, and I th one of the things that I found effective, and we actually we've seen studies that show that if you bring up facts, it can actually entrench people in their wrongly held beliefs, even though the facts disprove them. Um, so one of the more effective things to do is to actually go after their method of believing, and in this case, creationists believe on faith. So if you explain why believing in something based on faith rather than evidence is not a good idea and kind of attack attack the belief from that uh, vantage point, you might have a little bit better luck. Well, we'll have to get back to that question. <laughs> we have some more. We do. Rachel McKenna asks, I saw that FFRF was recently blocked on Twitter by Ken Ham. Why are creationists like him and others so quick to block people with opposing views on social media instead of engaging in debate? <laughs> well, and I mean, I think there's a, there's a great article that Valerie Tarico wrote about why religion is a closed information system. You know, it's incapable of dealing That's with new information. So, you know, if you're if you're continually presenting them with evidence that their beliefs are wrong, the best thing to do is to just shut that that inflow that inflow of information down. It's it's a very metaphoric action by Ken Ham, <laughs> isn't it? It is. It is indeed. But you would think they would welcome criticism because this would be an opportunity to make their case. They should be open to, let's hear it, let's bring it on. But don't you think, I'm a little more cynical than this, don't you think it's money? He's got this ARC park, right? And he wants people to think positively about going there. And if we are raising questions about this ARC park, we're going to impact the pocketbook of the Ark Park. Don't you think that's part of the deal? I mean, he, he blamed the poor attendance on the Ark Park on atheists like us. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of work uh, about educating people on that Ark. So we're, we're proud to take yep, that. And, he, and yeah. we, we did a video cool. with you there. Yeah, well, so we're happy it. to take the credit. Yes, we yeah. are impacting it. So this is a, a rather long-winded question that Terry Harmony asks. Um, what Ken Ham lacks in fact he makes up for in charisma? Ken Ham tweets about your or secular religion. He claims persecution by Chris, of Christians by the followers of your secular faith is on the rise. Have you ever or would you ever get involved in a case where you policed secularists jumping over the wall of separation and onto the other side? Take a scenario where an atheist group sought to violate the free speech from another group. Would FFRF stop that? This is a better summation of the question here. Is FFRF team atheist or team constitution of the United States of America? So there's quite no, a few things it's wrong. Team there. Constitution. <laughs> there, yes, I think that's the short answer to that long question. Yeah, but whenever I look at Ken Ham, the last word I think of is charisma. I don't, <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, you know he has this audience that loves what he's doing, and Christians like to feel persecuted, even in the New Testament. Blessed are you when you are persecuted. So they like they they have this sort of herd mentality of us you know, against the evil world out there. Mm -hmm. But I think that, I think Annie Laurie was right. Yes, as we are a constitutional group, we would go after an atheist who, cry. if there was an atheist high school teacher, for example, who was telling students, you need to stop going to church because belief in God is irrational and Jesus is a myth, that would be crossing the line. That, that would be government speech that was doing just the same bad thing that the creationist teachers do by crossing the line. We think the government should be neutral, although in, in practice, it's, it's not usually the atheists who are crossing the I've, line. I've ne we've never seen it. But it could happen, it I could suppose. Happen. There could be some yeah. angry atheist teacher who would want to you know, abuse the office to impose their atheism on the students. That would be just as bad, and I'm sure we would send a letter about that. You can't do that as a high school teacher. Sure, and just a few things in the question. You know, secularism and atheism aren't the same thing. The wall of separation guarantees a secular state. So would we be policing secularists jumping over the wall of separation? No, because that's what They're the wall of separation is. very unlikely to do so. <laughs> and then uh, a violation of free speech from another group, would FFRF stop that? Um, a violation of free speech the freedom of speech is guaranteed that the government won't get involved in your, your free speech activities. That's what the First Amendment says. Uh, it says that Congress shall make no laws uh, respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. So it's not about one group burdening another group's free speech. And perhaps so they're getting at there. the um, people in, in campuses that are basically shouting down um, speakers. I see. And I do very I much yes. think that is the wrong tactic. I'd be there with my picket sign, and I have many times. Yeah. But I would not go in and physically disrupt uh, a gathering that was being put on at a 
college university because I didn't like the person. I would educate about yeah. what was wrong with that. The best way to combat a bad idea is with a better right. idea. Right, maybe go in and ask a question, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't um, in, engage in harassment to the point where they could not go on. That happened to so many women. Um, well, that free thinkers especially, they'd turn off the lights in the 19th century. They, clergymen would come in and scream at them. We don't want to do that either. No. And I mean, that could very easily happen to us as well. You know, mm -hmm. we all go to college campuses regularly. That happened to me once. Issues. I was at the University of Iowa doing free speech week, talking <laughs> about freedom of religion. And right during my talk, someone turned my mic off. <laughs> and Hector Avalos had to go backstage and find my channel was turned down to zero. Wow. The and, ultimate. And when it came back up, I said, thank you for the compliment. How often do you say something so provocative during <laughs> free speech week that somebody turns your microphone off? That was fun. And That's we great. have another question? We do. Uh, from uh, Mensham Solomon asks, believing the Earth is less than 6,000 years old does no harm to anyone and has no effect on the development of technology or industrialization. Why do you care? if people are creationists. Well, it does do a lot of harm. <laughs> uh, I think, as I said, I think that it is retarding progress in our nation. You can't be a scientifically literate and productive society if you eschew facts like evolution that all of biology is predicated on. So it, it's very harmful to our productivity for our national standing. Um, as a, you were a, a science major, do you have any other I mean, thoughts? I, I agree with that completely. It, it, it impacts so many different areas of scientific advancement. Um, pharmaceuticals is a huge area where, I mean, if, if creationism were held by all or enforced by the government, which is what many religionists are looking for, you know, we would be back in the dark ages. Um, so I think, I think it does do a significant amount of harm. And we also are, this isn't an abstract concept that we're fighting against. You know, again, we've had seven complaints in, just in 2017. In about, public schools. In public schools about teachers imposing creationism on students. Uh, and that does do real harm. Absolutely. So that's the problem. It's not that we care what some person's private beliefs are. This is a free country, right? Even though they might be silly, dangerous private beliefs, we don't care if somebody thinks the world is 6,000 years old until they get into the science classroom and start telling all the students this is what you must believe or you must question the evidence. So it's not so much that we, we're bothered by people's beliefs. I mean, people might believe in leprechauns or elves or the mother goose or whatever. But when they're trying to use government to impose it on others or to in, stifle, or to stifle you know, the, uh, the, the facts of science, that's what we care about. And the, there is something to be said in the abstract for trying to believe as many true things and as few false things as possible. I as, agree. As I mean, we shouldn't be say. patting people on the back for being as ignorant as possible. We should be saying you really shouldn't believe in something if there's no good reason for it, and if there's not evidence. And most of religion is based on lack of evidence and on faith. Exactly. And there was this really scary article in the Denver Post, I think it was at the end of June, about the flat earth society That's right, the rise, yes. Which, uh, the rise of the, and they were going to try to put up a billboard, and we're going to try to put up one to counter it if they put that <laughs> one up. But flat earthers, mm -hmm. come on. How can it rise if it's flat? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I think we'll do our final question, and this is from George. George asks, do you think Ken Ham is going against the Bible, and will be going to hell for blocking people on social media. After all, it's a Christian calling to win souls for Christ. So is he wasting this opportunity to, to, to proselytize? I have some good news for Ken Ham. <laughs> he is not going to hell. <laughs> Smile, there is no hell. There is no hell. So, so he, he may have some sins against the intellect, but <laughs> he's not going to be punished forever, nor is anyone, uh, because of their beliefs on religion. But the question is assuming that Kim is consistent with his own biblical teachings, right? So shouldn't he be, the Bible says you should in all gentleness and meekness spread the gospel to every creature. So you would think, and I would have thought, shutting down debate is the wrong thing to do. It would be a very unchristian thing to do. Not very gentle or meek. Yeah. So, but smile there is no hell, I think, is right. a great spot to end the show on. So uh, next week, Next week, I think we're doing a special show. We're doing something very special? We're doing a Throwback Wednesday, I believe, for next week's show. It'll be very exciting. Ah. So join us next week, Wednesday at noon, for FFRF's Ask an Atheist.